Um, my name is Koei Kyo, I'm a software engineer at Facebook. Um, in this talk, I'm going to talk about how to move a mountain. It's about GraphQL migration best practices. Um, so immediately you're going to ask, I have a working GraphQL solution. Is migration even relevant to me? Um, and the truth is, GraphQL is such a vibrant community where new ideas are popping up any second. And those new ideas can either be brand new features, or it's just a better implementation to address our user feedback. And as we uh, try to incorporate those ideas, there is a challenge we constantly face. Um, that is to make the new ideas work with the existing system. Um, when we design um, the initial system, the V1, uh, we have no ideas what are the new things that is going to come up, or what can cause problems down the line. Um, therefore, more often than not, uh, we find ourselves uh, facing a migration situation. At Facebook, the GraphQL server and Relay team each carried out a massive migration project. From 2012 to 2019, we rewrote the entire GraphQL code base, both the client side and the server side, to be powered by modern implementations. Here we're talking about hundreds, thousands of Relay modules, for objects, interfaces, unions, mutations, and etc. So it's everything as big as the entire newsfeed to things as small as the visibility icon, all powered through the modern GraphQL. When we look back at those migrations, we found a lot of similar patterns, and we've distilled the lessons we learned into principles and practices to share with you all. Um, we're going to look at what we did. So what are some problems in the legacy system, and how do we solve them with the new system? Next, with the new system build, we're going to see how did we actually migrate that monolithic code base into the new system. In that section, rather than narrate the stories behind how Relay did it and how Server did it, I'll discuss it in terms of five important principles that both uh, Relay and Server followed that allowed us that successful migration. All right, to start with, let's look at the Relay Classic versus modern implementation. So back in 2017, when Lee Byron first announced Relay Modern, he explained the benefits of having a client, uh, what Relay Classic already achieved, and how we're able to do more with Relay Modern. The next few slides is going to be a recap of that talk. And for those of you who have already seen the talk, this will be a memory refresher. So Relay Classic already provide us with a lot of features to make our app a better experience. To name a few, we have render from cache. So what that means is if I navigate from one surface to another surface and that immediately comes back, I should be able to render immediately with cache without showing a spinner or going to the network again. Next, we have view consistency. So if I change my profile picture, then everywhere in the app that shows my profile picture should display the new one. And lastly, we have the optimistic mutations and rollback. Um, if our users click the like button under the post, um, we should be expecting the like button to turn blue immediately without actual, actually waiting for the server to perform the transaction. Really classic worked really, really well for a long time. However, with the emphasis changed from desktop to mobile, um, we found ourselves running into serious performance challenges. Um, mobile phones, they just have smaller CPU power, they have smaller memories. And especially with the low-end phones, the network bandwidth really poses additional challenges. So one of the things that we realize with Relay Classic is that the flexibility of the dynamic queries comes with great cost. What I mean by dynamic queries is that it allows us um, to, at runtime, being able to insert or delete a certain fields or fragment. And in order to do so, um, those are the steps that we need to do. The first, we would construct the query then we would serialize it to send to the network. 
Um, in the network part, we need to validate this newly constructed query and then execute it. So to solve that problem, instead of allowing us the flexibility to construct a query dynamically at runtime, what we do is we have a persistent query. So at build time or compile time, we would build our entire query into a query ID um, and then save this query in the database. So during network, what happens is the client only sends us um, the query ID as the request and the server is going to load up that query and execute it. That allows us to save the construction, the serialization, and validation time, because the validation is done at build already. Next up, we're going to look at the server legacy and modern comparison. So say we have this schema that has a root field of user, and this user type has a name field. What happens is you have an actual class um, that is uh, doing the actual data fetching. So we have the class user has a function called getName um, that returns um, the name field. Then we have an entire class um, called the wrapper class um, to, to allow you to expose the actual user class as the user type inside your GraphQL schema. And this is what we call the wrapper pattern. Um, and some of you may already be familiar with this pattern because it is exactly the same as our reference implementation, GraphQL.js, does. Um, and we find that there are things that doesn't really work well with this wrapper pattern. First thing is we have a lot of boilerplate code. As I just showed earlier, for simple types, um, your actual wrapper class can come up with three times more code than the actual implementation. Next, you need to do dynamic lookup at runtime. In order to uh, evaluate your name field, what happens is we need to look up um, this hash map, find the key called name, and then uh, dispatch this resolver. And this is, if you still remember what Dan talked about in the morning about whether your resolver should contain your business logic, this is the, where that we did a mistake of we making um, your resolver containing uh, your business logic. So the cost is, of course, it is slow. Next, we don't have any type safety. Um, there's no way for us to figure out whether someone had a type, make, make, made a typo, um, accidentally typed the string into an int. And what is more, it, it costs us greatly um, at runtime because we need to do expensive coercions of being to coerce any arbitrary type into the type that the GraphQL accept. And most of the time, those coercions probably don't make sense. Now, here is how the modern GraphQL solves all these problems. You have the exact same data class, um, user again, and we basically just annotate it. Um, we annotate the class with GraphQL object user, and we annotate the function get name with GraphQL field name. Here is we do the mapping. Instead of having your resolver uh, containing the business logic, here our resolver maps exactly to our business logic. And on top of that, we generate um, a runtime artifacts called final class GraphQL generated user type. This allows us to save a lot of boilerplate code because no one is writing them anymore. It's automatically generated. We get rid of the slow and expensive dictionary lookup um, and what is more is that um, your type safety is guaranteed statically. You cannot accidentally type uh, a return type into int. Um, that will be a static type error. Now that we have summarized a little bit about how um, Relay Modern and GraphQL Server make things better, um, let's move on to actually tackle the migration. And to begin with, the first principle is to always ask, do I want a migration? Um, to be honest, migration is a complicated and risky task. Um, it requires a lot of human effort and a lot of time. Um, 
A migration may never complete, and then you'll be stuck with supporting two systems forever, which might be a situation that is even worse than what you begin with. So therefore, it is very important for us um, to weigh the benefits and costs of a migration. And to weigh that, um, the things we recommend is to actually benchmarking with real data. For Relay, we rewrote the entire marketplace Relay module from classic to modern and found that we have saved a startup time of 900 milliseconds. On the GraphQL server side, we rewrote the poke mutation to the modern format and found it so, so much easier and faster to write, and we know exactly what type each field is. Next, we're recommending planning for incremental changes. Um, it would be easier if we can literally turn everything from legacy to modern at once with one commit. And to support incremental changes, we actually need to do a quite a significant amount of additional work. Um, because you have two systems running at the same time, you will need to write code for cross-system integration. Um, and for GraphQL Server, what happened to us is you have a legacy definition that has a field that is implemented in modern format, and you have a modern type that has some field is still in legacy system. Therefore, we're running into circular dependencies. So we actually need to write a whole lot of abstractions on top of it to break up the circular dependencies. Um, the truth is, incremental change is probably the only solution to go at Facebook scale. Um, but with a smaller code base, we would still recommend incremental changes because it comes with two additional benefits. One of them is safety rollback. What a migration means is that um, you need to have the exact same behavior from the legacy system to modern. And sometimes our migration would introduce a really small change that breaks things. Um, incremental changes allow you to just roll back the part that is breaking without onset the entire progress. Second, with migration, you will constantly find yourself in a 20, 80% rule. What that means is it only took you 20% of the time to migrate 80% of the work, and you spend 80% of the time tackling the 20% of annoying edge cases. Incremental changes allow 80% of your code base to take advantage of the modern system already, and you can spend the time and energy to just focusing on those edge cases. Now that we have decided to go with incremental changes, for a while you will find yourself in a situation that you need to manage two equivalent systems, that is, two parallel mountains. And our solution to this is to build adapters. First, let's take a look, look at um, Relay, how Relay did it. So we started with the classic API that calls into the classic core, and we have the modern API that calls into the modern core. To do so, we introduced an adapter called the core interface that is able to call into both the classic core and the modern core. Then we have the class API and modern API both call into the core interfaces. Therefore, we were able to get rid of the classic API. As we gradually migrate um, the classic core into modern core, we finally are able to left with entirely the modern system. For GraphQL Server, you will find the exact same pattern again. We have the legacy definitions using our legacy executor. And then we have the modern definitions. As we said earlier, we have modern generated artifacts that is used inside the modern executor. What we did is we introduced the legacy generated artifacts that can be used um, inside the modern executor. And then we can get rid of the legacy executor completely. As we incrementally migrate our legacy definitions into modern definitions, we were able to finally um, only live with one modern system. Next is that 
automation is really the key to the success of migration. By automation, what we mean is that the toolings you build so you don't need to migrate um, the code base manually. A both Relay and GraphQL server team write scripts that we call code mods. What that means is taking a file that is written by a developer, we were able to parse that into abstract syntax tree and ma manipulate and moderate those files into the new definition format. Um, so what, what that allows is basically taking a module or a definition, we pass that into the scrape, and the modern definitions come out. So automation comes with two advantages. First, about human errors. We don't mean automation can prevent human errors. To be honest, it can make things worse. Um, a script won't start making mistakes because it just gets bored. But again, we are the people who write those automations, and we will make mistakes. And if we run the script, it is actually the same mistake duplicated in every module and every definition. But what automation allows us is it allows us to iterate quickly. If we identify a bug, we can fix it as fast as possible because everything is, mod uh, is automated. And what that means is um, there are some times that we would tackle simple types first. We tackle the types without implementing interface. The next up, we would ta we'll tackle the types implementing interface. And next up, we tackle the types that has arguments in them so that we can make our automation um, as sophisticated as we want along with the incremental approach. Next is that automation allows you to introduce the inflection point of where the trend of things actually changed. So what that does is automation allows you to introduce a modern pattern into your code base at a massive scale so that your developers can organically picking up the modern ways of doing things. So to show the importance of the inflection point, here we have a graph of the really classic to modern module count. Um, if you notice, there is a big diff inside the orange line. Um, what that happens is we, we were having a logging failure on that day. Uh, none of the modules disappeared. Everything is fine. <laughs> and also to show this is actually what happened at Facebook. Um, so the blue line represents uh, the count of the classic modules. Um, and the orange line represents the count of the modern modules. So before we introduced um, the inflection point, what happens is that um, you can see that both the classic module and the modern module are growing together. And in fact, the classic module is growing at a faster rate than our modern modules. If we were to do everything manually, we would never be able to catch up. Until the point that we introduce the automation, that we introduce this inflection point, things start to change that our modern modules just grow faster and faster, um, and eventually none of the classic module left there. All right, so this is where the line is. Lastly, we have documentations and evangelism. Both the Relay and server team write extensive documentations on the benefits of migrating to the new system, um, and instructions about how do you run the code mod script to do so. Once in a while, we would post in FYI groups to encourage product teams to migrate their modules and definitions to the new format. We also took the chance to talk in every roundtables and internal hackathons. And with the help of every team in the company, we modernized the entire code base. At last, our code base finally enjoys the beauty, the magnificence, and the power of modern GraphQL. Through it, we were able to deliver meaningful social interactions to billions and billions of end users. The next time when you're facing with a mi migration, we hope you can use the principles we have here to land on your beautiful, magnificent, and powerful GraphQL mountain. Thank you very much. <laughs>